Good morning, First Unitarian. Well, on my screen, I see a I see a whole bunch of stuff, not just me, but that's okay. Good morning, First Unitarian, and happy Easter, this most holy day of the year in the Christian tradition. Uh, a couple things I want to let you know about um, uh, that we just learned uh, in the last day or two. Uh, we learned after Jen uh, composed her pastoral prayer. I want to uh, hold up Lloyd Schwab, who is a, a longtime friend of our congregation, a uh, dear friend of Beth Neva and Randall Lopes. Lloyd has been uh, positively tested for COVID-19. I don't know exactly where he is right now, uh, but I want to ask everyone to hold him in your thoughts and prayers right now. I want to hold up uh, Daryl Nickel, member of our congregation who had a health scare on Friday, uh, was uh, evaluated for what uh, appeared to be a minor stroke. Uh, and so I want to hold Daryl up and hope he gets uh, treatment that he needs and uh, stays healthy and strong and feels our love and support in this time. And uh, lastly, I want to hold up that uh, Maya Merrill uh, went into labor yesterday. Uh, so it's very possible. I don't, I haven't heard anything since then, but it's very possible that the uh, First Unitarian is going to have an Easter baby, a uh, very newest member of our congregation, possibly even right now as we speak. So uh, it is a very old story. But let's try, let's try and put ourselves into the middle of it for a moment, just for, just for fun. Uh, imagine that someone you greatly admire has died, and you were there. You watched it happen. And a couple of days later, after the Sabbath, after the memorial service, after the prayers and the tributes and the eulogies, after the pastor has finished everything up, just about the time they are laying the body into the ground, the body starts to move. And takes a deep breath and sits up and looks around. What would you do in that moment? Would you, would you be glad that they were breathing again and were, they were sort of back? Would you, would you think this was a sign from God? Would you flee in terror? Like when you were telling about this story, would you say, no, really, I know it sounds far-fetched, but but that's what happened. Would you, would you even tell the story ever? Or would you just hold it in your heart? That's almost exactly what I just described. That is almost exactly what the biblical story describes. The women go to the tomb and they find the stone has been rolled away. They find this, the tomb is empty. They are told he is not here. He has been risen. And this does not make them happy, right? This does not please them. Um, the scripture is quite clear. For terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I tend to think that um, even for people whose faith in the resurrection is central in sustaining, the actual thing would be more terrifying than celebratory. Things are just not supposed to work that way, right? The dead are supposed to stay dead, and if they don't, that would be a clear sign something is seriously amiss. Now, in our particular congregation, First Unitarian Denver, we are, we're not especially worried about whether these stories, this one or any of the other biblical stories, are literally, factually, historically true. Uh, I like to quote the biblical scholar John Crossan, who once famously said, uh, my point, once again, is not that ancient people told literal stories, and we're now smart enough to take them symbolically, but that ancient people told symbolic stories, and we're now dumb enough to take them literally. So, uh, to be both precise and blunt, right, the unabashed gospel of this story is not about life after death. It is symbolic guidance about life before death, the ones we have right now. So I want to focus for a moment on the tomb in this story and how we might think about that symbolically. Symbolically, there are so many human tombs. I know way too often in my own life and in my own spirit, I have made choices. I have 
locked myself in the tomb of some idea, or I've locked myself in the tomb of some assumption that I don't want to examine, or I have hidden behind the stone of some fear, or um, I've hidden behind the stone of some illusion of safety, or behind my need to be right, or my need to be in control. I suspect uh, we have all had that experience. And I wonder this Easter, are we already living in the tomb? When we, for instance, blindly accept some static answer to living questions? Are we already in the tomb when we internalize some of the crushing messages of our culture that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, not rich enough, not good looking enough, not whatever enough, or some other superficial, spiritually insulting garbage? Because being alive is about more than having a pulse. Being alive, being spiritually alive, is being open to the mysteries. Open to the mysteries of life and death and God. Open to beauty and love and transformation. Open even to the lessons of suffering and loss and betrayal. Leaving the tomb is about seeing the forest for the trees. It's about raising our eyes up to see the horizon instead of the walls that are closing us in, keeping our eye on the horizon of the infinite possibilities that are always, always around us, even if we don't see them. Leaving the tomb behind is about living into awareness and grace from wherever we happen to be at the moment. Because if we do that, this is what the scripture says, if we do that, we will be able to deal with anything that comes our way, anything that life throws in our path. So I personally believe Jesus would be mortified. That's an intentional pun, by the way. I believe Jesus would be mortified at some of the doctrines and dogmas and theologies that have sprung up about his life and his death in the last 2,000 years um, and the heinous things that have been done in his name. Because the teachings, the example, the story of Jesus could not be more countercultural. Not simply love one another, not simply love one another, but, but leave the tomb of resentment entirely. Just leave it. Just walk out that door. Love your enemies and even those who harm you. Jesus, in the end, loves even those who drove nails into his hands, saying at the end, forgive them for they know not what they do. Don't waste your precious life energy on the tomb of material concerns, but learn to love the ineffable mystery behind all things and know that the mystery, the mystery is your deepest guide and source in whose image you and everyone else were created. Trust in the love that is your nature, that is your birthright, even if you never understand. Isn't it true that the very deepest hope of our humanity is that this kind of spiritual capacity for love animated in the souls and actions of living beings just won't stay dead? Isn't that our deepest hope? Even crucified and locked into a tomb, that love will rise again, rise up again and again and again, world without end. Amen. I submit to you this Easter that the life and story of Jesus is intended to get us thinking about these kinds of questions, this kind of way of being in the world, or in the words of the great Howard Thurman. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask, what makes you come alive? And then go and do it. Because what the world needs 
is people who have come alive. Amen. So in just a moment, you're going to see two questions on your screen. The questions are, what do you love? And where do you see resurrection right now? When the music plays in just a minute, you're invited to share your thoughts, your reflections, your prayers with your community. I hope to see you again very, very soon. And thank you for joining us this Easter Sunday. God bless. Thank mm -hmm. you.